Welcome to Encounter Grace, where we come face to face with God's work in the world for our good. Join host Jason McKnight as we explore practical issues of community, theology, and leadership in everyday life. Welcome to Encounter Grace. I'm Jason McKnight, and we're glad you're here. All right, today I've got a question for everybody. When does sawdust smell the sweetest? Now, this is not a fifth grade joke or anything, but when does sm- sawdust smell the sweetest? When I was a kid, I used to love it when my dad and my grandfather would do projects around our cottage or around our house, and the sawdust was the best part of it because the, the wood would heat up and it would just kind of fall, and I loved that flying through the air. Clearly, I don't have any allergies. But I'm thinking of this today. When does sawdust smell the sweetest? And a question like it, what type of construction project does a community want the most? Well, to help us answer both those questions and a bunch more, we've got with us today Chris Jenkins. He's the Executive Director of Hope Restorations here in Kinston. Chris, welcome. Good afternoon. Glad to be here. I'm so glad you're with us, man. We're, we're going to have a great conversation. I know you're busy, so thank you for coming in. Glad to be here. Let's talk sawdust and let's talk change lives. All right. <laughs> uh, Hope Restorations is one of the most creative community-changing, and life-transforming ministries I've seen in a long while, and I want you to describe it. I wanted to describe it, but I thought nobody's going to do it better than Chris. Tell us what it is, who it helps, why it's there, how does it happen? Okay, the easiest way to start that is probably just to give our our mission statement. Excellent. Which is, uh, our mission is to provide paid employment and training and other support for adults recovering from addiction or incarceration. And the work that we do involves acquiring and renovating deteriorating eyesore properties in our poorest communities. That's great. So the net result is, is while we've helped the individual turn their life around, we've also reversed the blight and demise in our poorest neighborhoods and created more inventory of safe, energy-efficient, affordable housing for low-income families. I mean, I mean, we got to unpack all of those because every angle of that is amazing. It is sweet sawdust is what it is. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you, you take homes, well, you take lives that the world says has no worth, yes. and you take homes that the street says has no worth, and you watch God do something in both of those. Absolutely. That's unbelievable. Right. And that's actually one of the powerful things that we get to see unfold in our work is to see uh, a man or woman who at some point thought of themselves as worthless, mm-hmm. oftentimes because their family and the police and the justice system and sometimes even the church has told them such. And then to put them in a house working on it, that their first day on the job they're thinking, this thing's worthless. Mm-hmm. Somebody ought to just, it'd be better financially to just bulldoze this thing and start over. But in the process of doing the work, they realize that there was still good bones. Mm. There was still a good foundation, something to work with. And and when that adult has that aha moment and they realize I'm the house. Yeah. I'm the house. God created stuff in me that needs to be cleaned up, polished up, uh, exercised, improved, and thus then be ready to share it with the community. I'm just like that house. And, and that's a really powerful thing to see somebody have that self-revelation. And you get to see that a lot, don't you? Yeah. I mean, I've never thought of it in those terms. They're working on the house. They realize they are the house. Right. It's a sermon that preaches itself. <laughs> we don't have to tell them. It's something they realize on their own. The Spirit does it. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? It's awesome. Wow. How long have you been involved with this? Started. We found the Articles of Incorporation for Hope Restorations in 2015, <clears throat> which was... Um, couple of years after my son's death, I had Mm. messed around with with doing some uh, renovating old houses in East Kinston in the year and a half or so after Tate died. And after I had done a certain amount of of those projects, I realized that if I kept on doing that at the pace I was doing it, I was going to work myself right out of being a pastor, Mm. which at that particular point in my journey, I had no idea that that was the direction I needed to go. Um, And so we transferred from doing it for my own retirement purposes and enjoyment to doing it as a nonprofit. So we gathered up a, a group of people who became our board of directors, filed the articles of incorporation and started seeking grant money and mm. and you know, here we are today. It's been a quite a journey. Well how many homes are there? 
our, our target to become a completely self-sustaining social enterprise is 80. 80. That doesn't mean we'll stop at 80, but right. at, when we hit 80 and have them in rental, we'll no longer be completely dependent on philanthropic funds as we are today. Because the cash flow will run it. Right. It'll be just, it will keep on growing. Wow. So, so you, you, you get a home that is useless to everyone. While you change the home, someone changes a life. <laughs> yeah. And then someone can move into that home and all the neighbors love it. And that person is paying rent to Hope Restorations because that's, I mean, we pay as you go. That's how you do life. That's right. And part and of our that, ambition that, is to help those tenants become homeowners. Wow. Because they are usually of um, so little in uh, education, nor do they have home ownership in their heritage. They don't understand the profound impact that home ownership can have on multi-generational wealth building. I mean, so, it's true. So we're partnering with, with a couple of credit unions locally. Really? To try to help come up with some educational programs and community outreach work to, to help folks in those neighborhoods can kind of maybe show up for a lunch and learn mm -hmm. and begin the process of understanding what home ownership means. Even if it's a small, very affordable home, you know, to be building equity in that will have multi-generational impact. It really is amazing how that is true. Yeah. And, and they, they, all the statistics say home ownership is the number one driver of family financial stability. I mean, I don't want to say wealth because it's right. not the goal, but, right. but not living on the margin. Right. Yeah. Yeah, not, not living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. yeah. Chris, did you make this up? Is this, is this your idea? Like, did the Lord hatch this or is this going yeah, on in other yeah. cities? You know, I, I wish I could sit here today and tell you <laughs> that in 2015 I had this big master plan and had it all sketched out and no, it's really, it's really a living out of what Jesus promised us in Scripture, that if you're faithful in a few things, more will be entrusted to you. Mm. So our original vision when we gathered at Barney's Pizzeria for what was our first board meeting had more to do with simply acquiring some insulation, maybe through donation or raising some funds to buy a tractor trailer full of it, and then um, hiring day laborers like the guys who were living at the Flynn home mm -hmm. who needed some work and having them go into um, low income um, or uh, fixed income owner occupants homes in East Kinston and put some insulation in to save them some money on their utility bills. Of course. And, and so as we started looking for the funds to do it, we found out that um, because of the restriction on so many different uh, foundations in the way they give money. They don't like to give for wages and they don't like to give for capital work, you know, capital improvements. Exactly, which is insulation. Right. So, so this like they're saying, we're not going to build a new church building and we're not going to pay for administrative wages. And so um, we kind of went back to the drawing board and circled back to what I had been doing for myself, which was finding the houses in East Kinston who are, that are just so incredibly deteriorated that Mm -hmm. that you can buy them for almost nothing. And, of course, now that people know that we're a nonprofit, they give them to us. Yeah. But, like, the first one I ever did for myself, I bought a three-bedroom, one-bath house on a quarter acre of land for $8,000. <laughs> if you can imagine what kind of condition it was in. <laughs> but, but that was the birth of the mm -hmm. idea of Hope Restorations because in doing that project, I saw how the handful of men that I hired who were otherwise unemployable, mm -hmm. It, it impacted them positively. It gave them an honest, dignified way of supporting their family for a few months. Uh, it, it positively impacted that neighborhood and, and got rid of what was an eyesore, mm -hmm. uh, even a, a magnet for criminal and mischief activity. Um, and it, ultimately, it became a really nice home mm -hmm. with a very affordable utility bill for the family that moved in it. And so we circled back as a board of directors to that idea and started looking for funding. And our, our first funder, and still our very largest funder, is the Duke Endowment. Right. And I they were drawn that. to that very same uniqueness and creativity <laughs> that, that, that what you described. They're, what they said to us in the early stages was that we know a lot of folks who are interested in trying to solve the problem of um, reducing recidivism and reducing substance abuse. And, and we know lots of individuals and agencies that are working on the shortage of affordable housing for low-income families, but we've never heard of anybody anywhere mm -hmm. that's working on both problems at the same time with the same set of resources. And if y'all can figure out how to make that work and be moving towards becoming a self-sustaining social enterprise at the same time, we want to be a part of that. Yeah. And so they've been behind us from the very beginning. 
That's fantastic. In a, in a mighty way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember when the first Duke gift came. Yeah. It, it just, you know, we were I was on the mailing list or something, and what a joy. Yeah. What a joy to think, yeah, that was. Um, so tell us, I mean, I don't, you know, the friends, the the men, and, and I guess now women that, that are finding a new life transformed, um, I, we're excited about them. I don't want to. I don't want to sort of put anyone as a target or a, a like. I just want to hear a story without making someone a two dimensional story because it's a life. Right. But, but tell us, like, what what excites you about the people that you're you're watching God work in? I, I love it that um, maybe you could call it the prophetic piece of our work. Yeah, um, that we get to put out in front of the world, the community that every one of these individuals that's coming into our program are another human being created mm. in God's image. Mm-hmm. And far be it from us to just throw them in the trash, so to speak, or lock them away to keep us safe, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, our, our job as Christian disciples is not to seek our safety. Right. right? It's to go out in radical love and, and reach the world. And so um, part, of, part of the reason why our work is effective is because it is so relational, mm. right? And so some some efforts to help the people that we're helping try to reach a large number of people per grant dollar, mm-hmm. so to speak, and I hate mm-hmm. to just talk about it no, in financial but... terms. And so many foundations, the way they approve grants is just geared towards how many people are you going to serve with this grant dollar. Right. And, and our answer to that question doesn't satisfy a lot of them because we serve a relatively few mm. number of people at a time. Hmm. But we do it in a way that's highly relational, on the job site, getting to know each other, rubbing elbows together, you know, pre-pandemic, even bumping in and rubbing into each other's sweat. Yeah, know, that's right. And um, hearing each other's frustrations. And in that setting, particularly males with males, you know, locker mm-hmm. room kind of talk, yeah. sooner or later the trust builds up enough yeah. to where we can start helping the individual identify their own hurdles their own roadblocks. Sometimes you might call it the brick wall that they keep running into. Mm -hmm. And when they can begin to see that with their own eyes, they can start to imagine some different ways of living. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not like we've got this cookie cutter program that says, if you follow step A, B, C, and D in five months, you're going to have another job and you're going to be self-sufficient. And for some folks, it comes through our program. They might be in and out of our program in three or four weeks. And some, it might be 13 or 14 months. Right. But our philosophy is we don't give up on an individual. The only way they leave is if they either succeed or they give up on themselves. Hmm. Right? And we just do whatever it takes on an individual basis, which limits us then yeah. to only being able to help 15 or 20 at a time with our current staff. It and strikes me that Jesus probably wouldn't have gotten a lot of grant dollars either because three years he only you know got 12 and, and maybe even just three. Yeah. Well, <laughs> look, he even told the folks at the temple that this one woman given one little mite She's is more. outperforming all of you. Yeah, yeah, so outperforming. That, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, okay, so, so you alluded to it or you mentioned it a little ago, but let's hear a little uh, about the story that brought you to this place of needing to be restored with hope and the Lord birthing this vision through you, this ministry. But tell us about Tate and tell us about your journey there. Tate was um, a special boy, very Mm. intelligent, probably um, a little too intelligent for his own good, (laughs) for his age. You know, he understood too much about the world and it was kind of overwhelming for him. And uh, in his adolescent years, he developed, um, we don't know which came first, the self-medicating substance abuse or Mm. the mental illness. But we think it was mental illness, and then because he couldn't get any kind of diagnosis or the help he needed, that he began to self-medicate and Mm. ended up up with substance abuse Mm. issues and then ultimately took his own life in November of 2013. Wow. And so during that time, I was a pastor of Sharon United Methodist Church, and— one of my practices during that time was to take Friday as my Sabbath. I'm, I'm sure you know without telling you, Sunday is not a Sabbath for a preacher. Right, that's right. a work day. So yeah, it's the only a, day we work. Right, no, that's right. <laughs> it's only only you know hour and a half. You know? so, but no, yeah. so Friday was your Sabbath. Friday was my Sabbath, and but after Tate's death, that became a very very lonely, mm. dark time. You know, even though it was time alone with God, it was 
God and mostly me having shouting matches and questioning how this could happen and you know in this world where there's what we call the prosperity gospel getting preached everywhere you go then you've got the natural questions even yeah. even from me it's like well God I, look at what I had done I had yeah. devoted myself to your service and maybe I wasn't the best at it all the time and, you know um, but still that was my intent yeah. and this is the thanks I get and um so, and you're right. That that uh, is prosperity gospel thinking. You're right. Absolutely. That's not God's it's gospel so, thinking. It's so false. It's so false. It's so false. Because if the f- folks who just got a brand new Lexus today, if it's because God showed them favor, then what does that say about the kid somewhere that doesn't have food to eat today? That's right. Right, and that's just terrible, terrible. I won't even call it theology because it's uh-uh. not theology. No, it's satanic. So, but there's way too much of that kind of stuff being preached. Um, so, I had to find something different to do on my Sabbath day mm. without it being something that, you know, was just completely off track, you know? And so um, I had seen my wife watch enough episodes of HGTV <laughs> that I uh, just figured, hey, you know, that doesn't look all that hard. Right. I could do that. And so I started looking for a, a property and... Um, and because I had never done it before, there was just enough nervousness about it that I passed on a few projects that probably would have been, been a better choice than the one I ultimately did. <clears throat> Excuse me. But once I landed on that first one I already described to you, my plan was that that house would take me about eight months, eight months to a year, because mm-hmm. I had only intended for it to be me and maybe every once in a while to get my son-in-law to come help me do some heavy lifting on the weekends if I needed to like pick up a whole sheet of drywall yeah. or something yeah. like that. But otherwise, it was just going to be my little getaway. Yep, your Sabbath. It, my Sabbath. Your healing. But, but within a couple of weeks of closing on that property, I was introduced to two separate men. I knew neither one before. They knew neither of each other. But both of them had, had their own horrific story about their past mistakes, had them in a situation where they couldn't feed their family. Hmm. One of them had a severely special needs daughter hmm. that was in such critical condition that every year she qualified for the Make a Wish Foundation uh, kind of stuff. And, yeah, um, yeah. So I put those two guys together in that house, um, and they would call me and say, "What do you want to do about this? What do you want to do about that?" And I'll run to Lowe's or Blizzards or wherever and yeah. get them the materials they needed. Then I'd meet up with them on Friday and Saturday to work alongside of them, and um, all during that project neighbors would stop and just mm-hmm. park right in the middle of Cedar Lane and walk up and just say, God must have sent y'all here. This place has been such a mess for so long. Wow. And then in the latter stages of the project, those same little old ladies would stop and say, y'all are almost done. Uh, what's the date it's going to be finished? I got a granddaughter or a niece or whatever, and I'd love for them to live here. Mm-hmm. And so it was really neat to see that happening in the community. Um, and then ultimately the the f- woman that moved in my house um, – the day she moved in, she immediately began referring to it as her house. Hmm. And so at the end of that project, I really just kind of sat back and reflected and, and hmm. said, this has been a really good experience. It has given me a creative outlet and something to do that's building up in the community. Um, ministry without having a pulpit, so to speak. Yeah. And um, and it was very Sometimes good. Sometimes the best kind. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, certainly. If that's what St. Francis of Assisi said. Over there, I mean, right? all of us yeah, are ministers. That's right. And um, it was really good for those two men. It mm. gave them a dignified way of putting some food on their family's plate and catching up on some rent and that kind of thing. Um, it was really good for that neighborhood yeah. because it got rid of that, that place that was attracting criminal and other activity. Mm-hmm. Um, and just the, the downward pressure of property values, what an eyesore like that does in a neighborhood. And then it was good for the family that moved in it. And so I thought, there's no reason not to do that again. Yeah. So I found another one about two blocks away and did that. And then I found one uh, in Greenville and did that one. And then I did another one here in Kinston. Uh, the one in Greenville was a duplex. And so I went from no knowledge, no training, no experience, and no desire to have anything to do with renovating houses or be a landlord to having five units in rental in about 18 months. Wow. Yeah, and so I kind of did a timeout on myself. <laughs> that's that's when I realized that if I keep on, I'm going to be a renovator landlord company instead of 
a pastor in the United Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, I was having a phone call each month with a life coach. Mm -hmm. you know, um, and so I was describing my dilemma to Frank and really kind of embarrassed that I hadn't thought of this myself. But as I described my dilemma mm -hmm. that I needed this creative outlet and it was so good in so many different ways, um, he's the one who just said, well, have you ever thought of making it a ministry? Mm -hmm. And so you could say that was the, the beginning of Hope Restorations because I thought, yeah, that's a wonderful idea. Mm -hmm. So that way I could just keep this going. Yeah. We, did, we started out hoping that we could do this as just an all-volunteer board of directors. And for the first year, that's what we did. But it didn't take long once we got fully funded yeah. and tried to run at full-scale operations. So this, uh, we were just really, really fortunate that first year with just volunteer supervision that somebody didn't fall off a ladder <laughs> or get hurt. Yeah. You know, there was a lot of building materials wasted from people mm. who didn't know what they were doing, working without somebody there showing them what to do. That's a good point. Yeah. But um, so we, we, you know, conferred with the Duke Endowment and revamped our budgets and made a more realistic financial plan and mm -hmm. started at an executive level staff and it had just continued to grow from there mm -hmm. so. it's unbelievable yeah i mean that is that is amazing but that the lord used your need to process tate's death yeah. and he used that to bring home and new life to so many Mm -hmm. It's just unbelievable, but only God can do that. That's right. That's the way God works. <laughs> it's right? the way He works. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by the way, you you uh, are a big part of this movement in Kinston called F three. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, that's Fitness Fellowship and Faith. F three Fitness Fellowship and Faith. Yeah, and so the way we talk about it is the uh, the fitness is the magnet that gets men out there. Mm -hmm. The fellowship is the glue. <clears throat> that holds them together, yep. and then the faith is the dynamite. No, I and love so it. So the mission of F3, it's not, we do use workouts, but the mission of F3 is to plant, grow, and serve free outdoor workouts for men hmm. for the reinvigoration of male community leadership. Hmm. That's the real important yeah. part. Yeah. And so um, we've got 21 different workouts across Lenore County each week now. Um, wow. So there's a wide variety of um, – <clears throat> location and time and workout styles. Can we, I be in the couch potato one? Um, <laughs> no. We don't, we don't have one of those yet. <laughs> but we do, we, we do tell everybody that it's you versus you. Yeah, it's true. So whatever workout level you show up to, you do what you can do, listen mm -hmm. to your own body, yeah. modify the type of exercise and or the intensity as needed. And we're not out there competing with each other, so right. nobody's going to be – giving you a hard time if anything you'll find that guys will come alongside and really really encourage you and root for you right and help you out yeah. what's your f3 name goggles goggles yeah. <laughs> Why? because of the work goggles no no um because the first time i ever went to an f3 workout it was in greenville on a bitter cold day and it was i think it was sleeting or freezing rain something like that and the way they do your nicknames is you get your nickname after your wor first workout and whoever's in charge of the workout of the day is the one who gets to name you. <laughs> and so there was just three of us there that day, me and two other guys. And it was so cold. And they asked me in that workout, this, this is your first F3 workout. How'd you get in this kind of shape? And I said, well, I'm a swimmer. Ah, uh, there and you I'm, go. And so they started asking me some questions about that, enough to get me to describe this goofy looking get up i use a <laughs> waterproof mp3 player and a swim cap oh, wow. and you know and all these kind of training things and my goggles and to with it being so cold they had heard enough said it's goggles now let's get in the truck and go home it's <laughs> cold here <laughs> so. i love it and that's why you have uh you 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 told us your watch says you have a uh, the fitness body of a 20 year old yeah i love it yeah when i was 20 i didn't have the fitness body of a 20 year old i didn't either <laughs> yeah that's, that's a relatively new uh, thing for me. But well, and, yeah, so this watch was worth the money for it to have such an encouraging I know message it, on it sometimes. I'll take one of those. Yeah. I'll take one of those. Well, I know I could get one if I came to F3, but I, I am swimming, so I'm, that's I'm really out there. That's a really good exercise. And I don't have to go quite as early. Although I did not realize there's 21 of them throughout Lenore County, so mm -hmm. there's got to be one at, at a time no I could do. Yeah. yeah. I want something available every day of the week. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, I love it. I love it. Okay, let's talk Hope Restorations again and, and just kind of land the plane here a little bit. Um, on the home page of the website, which, by the way, what's the website? Uh, www.hoperestorationsnc.org. 
Okay, hoperestorationsnc.org. Yeah. Um, there's, I think it's on an, like the homepage or something. There's an early uh, circle with, with um, dots around it saying the seven things y'all are involved in uh, as part of the goals or the vision. And I think it's probably on the screen if someone's watching this now. But I'll say them for, the, for our listeners. Employment training program, renovate deteriorating houses, landlord property management. So I feel like you've helped us with all of those. Like I, I think we get a good sense of that. And then I love the next four, social entrepreneurs, social enterprise, disciple making, and then community outreach, which, which maybe just sort of talk a little bit about social entrepreneurs and social enterprise and disciple making. Okay. Well, the simplest way I think to talk about that is the realization that what we've talked about so far that Hope Restorations is doing is all work that we could be doing for profit. Mm. It's profitable work. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just that we have chosen to do it with a def- different definition of profit. Right. For us, for us, profit is not distributing financial gains to shareholders. For us, profit is benefiting the community at large. And so we don't distribute any income to anybody. It just keeps getting reinvested. Right. We're on 501c3 nonprofit organization. So by law, no, right. we don't have a board of directors or a, a group of stockholders who would, who would yep. take a cut on what we're doing. Just, um, and in fact, one of the things that we have not added to that circle yet is that once I got the general contractor's license, we realized that that could supplement our ambitions to be self-sustaining. So we go out and do contracting work now for people who have the ability to pay yes. and then use those proceeds to fund Reinvest. the work we do for people who have no ability to pay. Mm. And so it's still profitable work. Right? Yep, yep. Um, and and, uh, and that, I think that's important because it, money matters, and, and I don't, I don't want to say more than that, but it, but it matters. And why it matters is it's a good measurement. Mm-hmm. Like you, you understand if something is worth it so to like, let's say I'm a, I'm a paying customer and you come and renovate, you know, my, my bathroom or my shed or something, it's only right that I pay you market rate. What you as Hope Restorations do with that is up to you. You want to buy a boat with it is great. Right. But if you want to turn around and help the person down the street who can't afford it or, you know, I think that's great. But, but this part of it, you to me as the paying customer is still uh, at, at a supply and demand market rate. And that's important because right. that keeps me from taking advantage of you. That's right. And vice versa. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's great. Yeah. And so the, the social entrepreneurialism mm-hmm. is just related to that. It's constantly yeah. trying to think of new ways to do that. So, so for right now, someone standing across the street from our office on Mitchell Street who didn't know who we were would just assume that we're a renovation company and, and landlord property right. management. They would have to get inside of our discussions and our financial statements to see that we're a nonprofit organization with a different uh, thing of doing. Mm -hmm. And so our real mission is to help adults recover from addiction or incarceration. Mm -hmm. And so I doubt it will happen in my lifetime, but were we to run out of available properties to (laughs) renovate in Kinston or nearby, then we would have to find some other enterprise to put people to work mm. because that's really what our, our, our work is. It's not right. primarily fixing houses. Well, by the way, I just read in the paper at lunch, 3.8 million housing uh, unit housing shortage in the United States today. Mm-hmm. We're, we're short almost 4 million units of housing. So we can start building some new houses too. Right. <laughs> and we got the land in Lenore County to do it. Right. And, you know, so the Habitat for Humanity uses that mm-hmm. sort of model is mm-hmm. to allow lower income folks to sweat some equity mm-hmm. into a new home. We chose not to Im- imitate the Habitat model because we already had such an inventory in our community yes. of real estate that's already been set aside for residential. And oftentimes, even though it's an expensive endeavor, to renovate these houses, it's not as expensive as building one from scratch. Mm. You know, and it's certainly not as expensive as demolishing what is already there, taking it to the landfill, and then starting over. Right, so right. That, but we, we spend on average forty to $50,000 per house, including the materials and the wages that we pay to our program participants. Wow. Yeah. And does that include the purchase price? Or that's once you have the home, once yeah, you we, own it? We haven't bought a property since our first year in operation. Wow. So we, we bought a few in our very first year, but after that, the word got out in the community, the, 
the CPAs and attorneys in our community know who we are, and they have clients who are – usually we get our influx of properties in December. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. trying to meet the December 31st deadline for this tax year. And thank the Lord for the tax code. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That gets and that. So that's, that's how we – since 20 – the first part of 2017 – Every property we've got has been donated to us, including but not limited to the what is now the House of Hope yes. that used to be the Flynn home. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm so thrilled that that with the long history on that corner yeah. of um, of helping folks is still in that business today, the House yeah, of Hope. Yeah, they were one of our first partners because we, mm-hmm. we are very committed to avoiding replication of services. I see, yeah. it, I see it as failed stewardship. Mm-hmm. for an organization like ours to go and reinvent something that already exists in the community. Yeah. And then you're competing for resources, you're competing for staff, you're even ultimately competing for the same constituents to mm-hmm. serve. And why not partner together? Yeah. So when we realize there's a service or resource that one of our participants needs, we look to uh, partner with somebody in the community. Um, y'all's coat closet is a perfect example of that. We come. Uh, consistently right. have people calling us wanting to know if we take coats and shoes and pants because they're it's usually a woman calling saying I'm sick and tired of my husband's closet I'm going to fix it this weekend <laughs> <laughs> or I'm going to make him fix it this weekend mm-hmm. and so we say no you need to call Grace Fellowship Church we partner with them yeah. rather than replicating what they're doing right and it works and then when one of our guys needs clothes we call and, and bring him there. over and yep. he goes through your coat closet and gets what he needs it's a perfect you do what you do best, and that frees us to do better what we do. And and when you say you do what you do best, by that we mean Dee Dee and the team. Because well, yes. <laughs> they, are, they are the ones on they're the, the front ones lines. It done. Yeah. I'm telling yeah. you, it's just amazing. Everybody has their role in the That's kingdom right. of heaven. It's a, yep. it's a huge banquet that everybody's invited to, but everybody's expected to bring what they've got for the good of all. So yeah. it's... It, it's that's really fun. So it's like a potluck, except we don't do anything to get in. Right. <laughs> but once we're in, it's that's a potluck. Right. That's right. Just show up is all yep. you do. Yeah. That's right. Mm-hmm. Show up in belief in Jesus. Um, oh, Chris, this is so much fun to talk to you. So much fun to hear, you know, what what God is doing and, and why it's such a worthy investment and uh, why he's why he's doing this in our community right now. Yeah. Uh, we want to tell you something. You don't know this, but we, as Grace, the body here, want to be part of Hope Restorations in a new way, and we want to give you a check for $2,500. Awesome. We, we don't do this with every guest, I'm <laughs> telling you. <laughs> but we're the mission team at Grace, which is a subset of our body that, that prays and seeks out where to invest the Lord's money for kingdom return. Um, they said, we need to make a gift to Hope Restorations. And so, so we are excited. That's wonderful. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for, for your continued support. Yeah. Well, where, how can folks be involved? HopeRestorationsNC.org. Mm-hmm. And that's probably the best place, and they can get to you that way? That's the easiest way to, to reach us, um, or just simply call our office. Yep. 252-560-7507. Yep. Um, and then our phone system is one of these internet-based things, so if they it'll get, get to you. They want to get patched through to my extension. Yeah. It doesn't matter where I am; it pops up on my cell phone. So. Well, it sounds like just because whether you have uh, a construction ability or whether you have mentoring willingness or whether even the lunch and learn kind of a program, whether you have something you can offer that way people listening to this, there's just a bunch of ways, even back office stuff. Right. There's just a bunch of ways we can be involved. And it seems like we could probably just show up and God will tell you how to use us because he seems yeah. to be unrolling this with yeah. no master plan, except he knows that we don't. Yeah, early on, and still to some extent, the way I've dealt with potential volunteerism is I would just have somebody come and spend half a day with me, show them around, explain what we're doing, how we're doing it, why we're doing it. And also share what some of our current hurdles or struggles are. Mm -hmm. And in those conversations, then that individual can begin saying, well, I have this gift or this ability or this training. And if they want me to, with the time I have available, I could work on that for them. Mm. But we don't have like at any given time, we don't have a list of here's volunteer roles that needed to be filled. It's more like you come to the table with an interest and a passion. And if you're really serious, we'll find a way to plug you in. We'll watch. Yep. Yep. 
Chris, thank you so much. Thanks for having me and helping get the word out about what we're doing. I love it. I, I and I think I mean I think our folks are going to be jacked up and and the folks who listen to this and it's it's broader than just grace but they're going to love hearing and many of them don't know that God has started a whole new model of a ministry right here in Kinston restoring hope one life one home one neighborhood at a time and I just love it. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. We look forward to being with you again. Share this, literally share this with a friend that whether they're in Kinston, they need to know about it, or whether they're in another city, they need to replicate it. But let's see God work. And uh, I love it because folks coming out of prison, folks coming out of addiction, they have a future, and we can be part of that in Jesus' name. Absolutely. Great. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you. This is a ministry of Grace Fellowship Church in Kinston, North Carolina. Visit gracekinston.org or follow us on Facebook and Instagram.